Are we up? Okay. Hello, everyone. We'd like to uh, try to get started on the meeting if we can. You guys can. I still can't hear me, okay. Why can't they hear? That's for sure. Hello, if I could have everyone's attention for a minute. We just need to uh, get the planning board meeting officially opened and then we can get on with the presentation. So I know everybody's still speaking, but I guess I'm going to move on with what we have to do on our end. <laughs> so I know I don't have it. <laughs> no, that's okay. We won't use it right now. Okay, so we'd like to call to order the meeting of the planning board for Wednesday, October 24th, 2018 at whatever time past seven it is right now. So our four, first order for tonight is going to be envisioning Duxbury Master Plan Phase 2. So now I do need everyone to start to pay attention. Now I think we're going to skip open forum right now. <laughs> you didn't have anything? Okay, that's good. So if everyone could uh, gather around, take a seat, we're going to get ready to get started and get Josh on his way with his presentation. We're herding cats. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Please uh, take a seat if you would. Thank you very much. So we would like to thank the planning board. Uh, thank you, Chair, for introducing us this evening and calling the meeting to order. We'd also like to thank uh, Valerie Massard and Ashley McMillan of the planning department uh, for having us here this evening and coordinating with us throughout this process. Um, my name is Josh Fiala. I'm a planner at Metropolitan Area Planning Council. And I've been managing the Duxbury master plan process, Envision Duxbury. We're in transitioning now into phase two, so we welcome you all to this phase two forum this evening. And we have with us this evening a pretty broad team of planners from the agency, which I'll introduce in a moment. But first, just a little bit about us. Uh, so we are the regional planning agency of the Boston area communities. Uh, Duxbury is one of those communities, along with 100 others uh, within about the 495 belt around Boston. Uh, so we provide uh, technical planning assistance to the communities in the region. Uh, including master plan efforts such as this one. So we're happy to be here this evening and happy to be here uh, along with this process uh, at the invitation of the town. Um, we are a state agency and state employees, uh, and so we provide those services uh, in partnerships with, like this with municipalities. So with me this evening are uh, quite a few folks uh, which will introduce themselves as they speak, but I'll just uh, go through their names now and maybe they can give a quick wave uh, so we have Raul Gonzalez, Travis Pollock, Joe Saki, Carolina Prieto, Darcy Schofield, and Sasha Shiradov. So thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, and I think it's also important to state that you all here are, are doing us all service by being here this evening in light of the scheduling of World Series events. Um, so thank you. We'll try to be as quick as possible to get you out for the first inning. Um, but this is a long-term important planning process. So in the light of the horizon, the time horizon of this type of planning, we could expect the Red Sox to be in the World Series, you know, three or four more times over the next <laughs> 10 to 20 years. So we're happy uh, that you guys are here this evening, at least making the short-term commitment uh, that there's potential plenty of conflicts around this evening. So why are we here this evening? We want to recap. Uh, this has been a, uh, it continues to be a long process, and some of you might not have been involved yet, so we want to recap what the master plan is about. But we also want to talk and focus on the phase two existing conditions, uh, the topics of which are on the screen. Uh, I'm managing the process, but 
am not leading the, uh, the specialized efforts of these topics, so we'll be cycling through each of our uh, planning staff this evening and giving you highlights from the existing conditions work that we've been doing to hopefully uh, seed conversations which will continue after the presentation. We're happy to answer questions one-on-one -on -one in the open house setting. And then as you started, some of you started to interact with, we have boards around the room. And after this session of presentations, uh, please uh, engage with those boards and give us feedback uh, on all the information that we have for you this evening. We're really looking for your feedback tonight. Uh, the master plan uh, is providing an update on a master plan which was previously completed in the town in 1999, so it's well overdue. Uh, and we're looking at ways to make sure that you all are involved in getting involved with this process because as we're facilitating the master planning effort, it really is your plan and we're trying to make sure that it reflects your priorities, your vision and your goals for where the town is headed in the future. So just a quick overview before I hand it off to our uh, first topic. So what is the master plan? It's a strategic framework that guides future physical and economic development uh, based upon the community's vision and goals. So we're setting all of those things. As I mentioned, it's your plan, your vision, and your goals. So we're trying to pull those things out of the community in sessions like this uh, and through some other measures as well, which I'll uh, recap the types of things we've been doing. It will provide the town with a vision for the future. We have a draft vision statement on one of the boards in the back. Uh, and it will also provide goals and strategies in each of the topic areas of the master plan uh, to help the town usher investments in certain directions, steward resources, and capitalize on, on opportunities because change uh, will happen in our communities all over the region, and we want to make sure that that's positive change as you all view it. So where have we been? What are we talking about tonight? Uh, so the elements on the your left here are uh, elements that we covered in phase one of this process. Uh, so you'll see those reflected in the back of the room. Uh, to, to your rear, we talked about housing, historic and cultural resources, and open space primarily. We did a demographic uh, look at the patterns occurring in the town today, and then also set that vision statement, which I mentioned. Then we're also looking in phase two at economic development, transportation and connectivity, public facilities and services, sustainability in regard to climate and energy uh, aspects. Then looking at land use and zoning, how all of these elements come together uh, to form places in the town and think about how uh, investment will occur on properties, uh, and then also implementation, how do the actions all point in the same direction to get to the, that vision. The master plan applies to the entire town, so we're looking at all, all corners and all areas uh, and thinking about how, how all areas of the town work together in a coordinated fashion as the town wants to see them work together. The process has been, uh, is a long one, so it's about two years in total. We're about halfway through the process now, uh, transitioning from phase one to phase two. We have uh, draft elements, so you can see those and download them. They're available online at the website for the project, envisionduxbury.mapc.org. Uh, and you can see how these elements that we're talking about tonight will be uh, headed towards that type of pro product in the end. Then we're pulling everything together. We'll be meeting with another community forum with you all uh, I believe in March of 2019, to uh, show you how everything is coming together and get your feedback and have you weigh in again. We've also been meeting with the planning board along the way to check in with them as we've been progressing through phase one and phase two. We'll plan to wrap up the entirety of the plan at about the beginning of the summer, middle of the summer of 2019. The process has been community engaged uh, and oriented. Uh, including forums such as the one this evening, but also other aspects like an online survey, which garnered 1,200 responses last fall uh, on all of these topics, uh, both phase one and phase two. So that was a, a tremendous amount of input from the community. We also have master plan ambassadors who are citizens uh, with various interests in the town who have been helping us engage uh, citizens in conversations. I wonder if, if there are some master plan ambassadors in the room, if they might just quickly show their hands I think we have a few this evening. So we, we so we thank them for their help throughout the process, and it's been great to have uh, on the ground uh, folks who are helping us get the word out and engage in those conversations and give us direct feedback on the process. Uh, we've also been working closely with the planning board, as I mentioned. We have the website, which I've also mentioned the address. We'll show that later on on another slide. 
uh, and we, we're constantly updating that with all of these types of presentations and information such as the boards around this room. I did just mention this 1,200 responses, but it's worth mentioning again, uh, the survey which covered a variety of topics and the, the results are summarized on two boards in the back you can take a closer look at in the open house setting. You can also take a look at the demographic analysis that was performed on one of the boards in the back. I won't belabor that now, giving some room to the other topics we're discussing this evening and the vision statement which I mentioned, which is too small and long to read on the screen now, but it is at the back and you can take a look at it in detail. As I mentioned, we talked about housing, historic and cultural resources, and open space in phase one, and have set those up nicely uh, to transition into phase two. So again, we thank you all for being with us this evening uh, and working with us to really pull together what is a pretty comprehensive collection of topics and understanding your perspectives on them. I'm gonna hand it off to Raul Gonzalez to get us into a phase two topic with economic development. So as Josh, mentioned, as Josh mentioned, my name is Raul Gonzalez, and I'm an economic development planner at MAPC. So um, uh, what I'm uh, doing here today is just describing a little bit about the uh, basic economic development research that we've done, as well as to draw you over to the uh, economic development uh, boards over in the corner over there afterwards. Um, but just some basic uh, information about Duxbury's economic development. Um, the commercial areas within the town are um, fairly lim limited. There's about eight um, commercial areas. Um, some are like uh, Halls Corner or um, Snug Harbor are, are, are um, larger compared to perhaps some of the smaller areas which are only one or two businesses. Um, so the element that we're of the uh, master plan that economic development is, is formulating, uh, we've put together the existing conditions, uh, industry profile, uh, workforce profile, opportunity sectors, and opportunity areas, which I'll give some information on right now. Uh, the next uh, steps will be uh, fiscal considerations as well as development of constraints and limitations. So for the industry profile, um, the town uh, has a 3.5% unemployment rate as of July 2018. Um, so as a, a, of a labor force of about uh, 7,600, there were 7,400 uh, people that were employed. And as I mentioned before, the major commercial centers include Halls Corner, Snug Harbor, and Millbrook. Um, with regards to wages, households in, Duck in Duxbury have a median uh, annual income of $165,000. Um, that's uh, other than uh, Situate, the only other six-figure um, community in uh, the area. That's about three times as much as the uh, median income for the United States and uh, is about $112,000 more um, than uh, the town of Plymouth, which was on the lowest end. As for wage growth, households in Duxbury saw uh, an annual income increase within the four-year period of, of um, I believe, 2012 to 2016. And uh, that was actually was considerably higher than almost all of the other towns with Situate um, a distant second. As for uh, employment in Duxbury, um, it grew also at a, at a pretty um, good rate of 9.2% um, within the um, one year period. And the most common job groups uh, by number of people living in Duxbury, and I, I apologize for the error here, but it's actually uh, management business and uh, financial operations, uh, legal services, uh, education, training, and library, and then followed by health practitioners. So what I'm going to be talking about now is actually also related to the boards that we have put up. Um, we did a retail gap analysis for the area using Hall's Corner as the center point uh, of a local uh, five minute drive time, which is also um, uh, about a 15 plus minute uh, walk time as well, and that's the green um, circle within there. Um, and then a second um, a larger trade area of a 10 minute drive time. And then the blue um, line being the 15 minute limit of, uh, of the, the larger trade area. So what we did uh, for, the, for these geographies was uh, uh, essentially was a leakage and surplus uh, uh, report so what this does it, is that it measures the balance between the volume of sales generated by uh, local businesses and the volume of retail potential, that is the demand for um, household spending on retail groups within these areas. 
Um, and also the leakage surplus factor enables a one-step comparison of supply against demand and in a simple way essentially identifies the business opportunity. So essentially what's labeled in green are, uh, are leakages where, where in other words, um, the demand exceeds the supply in this local uh, geography and the, that, uh, that is located, that is in red and in negatives are surpluses. That is where supply actually exceeds demand within the local area. So what I put together for those boards are all of the types of businesses that uh, would do well in certain uh, scenarios for the town of Duxbury. Uh, one thing in particular to keep in mind is that although this is a, a really a excellent comparison, um, it does not include uh, um, e-commerce or um, what is now um, what you would say would be the Amazons and the other uh, major um, online retailers that does take an effect when it comes to doing studies like this so that's something to certainly keep in mind but um, the activities uh, essentially in the back are those that would still do well uh, in spite of this but um, generally um, probably um, these numbers are a little more generous um, so I believe that is the economic development section, and if you have any questions, I'll be in the back. Good evening, everyone. So my name is Travis Pollack, and I'm a transportation planner at the uh, Metropolitan Area Planning Council. So I'll be talking about transportation and connectivity, and I like to use the term connectivity because it shows that um, Transportation is something that we undertake because we're often trying to get to some place. There's a reason why we're out driving or walking or cycling. Sometimes it is for exercise, but most of the time we're traveling out and about because we want to try to uh, reach some sort of destination and that's and safely and, and, and easily. So that's the reason why we have transportation. And in the report, um, I won't go over the history and evolution of, of transportation in the area, but uh, we'll talk about about the commuting characteristics some of the previous planning work and the infrastructure that is in Duxbury I'll talk about that tonight so uh, most of the roadways and streets in Duxbury are locally controlled you know your, your two larger um, roadways that run north south and route 3a those are controlled by by mass dot 3a and 3 um, and those are very important roadways but the uh, vast majority of the streets of course are, are locally controlled and uh, there's been actually, from what we can look at, there's actually been very little change on many of the streets in terms of the vehicular traffic. Now, 3A has seen an increase, Route 3 has seen an increase some, in some areas. That doesn't mean that you're not experiencing certain traffic congestion at certain times of the day, around schools or other areas in certain times of the year, on weekends maybe with tourists. But overall, the roadway, as you can see from these figures, for example, on, uh, on Washington Street, uh, 4,900 cars from 1990 to almost today. So that has not changed much. What has changed a lot from what we can look at at the data is the crash rates. And so what you're seeing here are um, the crash rates of from 2010 through 2014. They've gone up a little bit in 2014. And I can tell you now, um, we looked at 2015, 2016 data, which has finally become available. And in 2015, the town had 229 crashes. And in 2016, there were 260 reported crashes. So we're definitely seeing an increase. And you're also seeing an increase countywide. The, the county now, Plymouth County, has over 11,000 crashes in 2016. So uh, this is something we're seeing statewide. This is something we're actually seeing nationally, um, trying to find out exactly why. There's a lot of debate on this. But it shows um, that there is a need for looking at this and trying to see if there's ways to improve the safety along our streets. We'll come back to this in a, in a little bit later. So some of the other things that I um, want to talk about for the existing conditions, uh, in, as you may know, there is one bus route that runs through town uh, for Gatra, and uh, they recently looked at and have done a pilot to run it along Washington Street to see if it, um, how it worked in terms of ridership. Uh, I have talked to them. They said they were going to look at the numbers and get back to me on whether or not they think that that should be done permanently or not. Uh, other important transit services are um, the senior center providing transportation for seniors as well as D Gatra has a uh, bus that does uh, take some people for medical trips up to Boston. Parking uh, is an issue in certain areas. We, we, we recognize that. We have, from what we've read and talked and seen, um, there are some areas that have had some previous studies like Halls Corner and Snuck Harbor 
um, but we don't think there's been an actual town-wide survey of, of all the areas for parking. So certainly parking can be an issue at various times, again, uh, at various times a day and at certain locations um, where, there, where there is a, a little bit more activity. In terms of the commuting that um, we're seeing in the town of over 83 83% of the people work, uh, excuse me, drive to work uh, when they when they commute, and that is slightly higher than what we're seeing statewide. It's higher than the than the Boston area overall. It's about 70% for Boston, about 78% for the state of Massachusetts. Um, we're also seeing that uh, this is something that's a national trend too. Work from home is continuing to increase, and when we say work from home, it doesn't mean the occasional work from home. We're talking about people that work a majority of their time from home which has now gone from five to 10% in the last uh, you know, 25 years or so. This is a, mirrors a national trend where now working from home is actually higher nationally than taking transit to work. So the reason why I bring this up is that that can sometimes impact traffic a little bit in certain areas, depending if people are working from home, when they might take midday trips or take afternoon trips, maybe the time of day when they take these trips can be slightly different. Um, most of the commuting is within locally in the area, within Duxbury. Uh, there, Boston is the largest single place where people commute to work, but when you look at the overall trends, Duxbury and the, and, uh, the area locally is where you see a large concentration. And so what this map shows is where people who live in Duxbury and where they work. And it gets down to a very specific zip code, so you can see the concentration within the town along the coast and then down to Kingston and Plymouth. As well as up along Route 3, you start to see that pattern then in Boston as well. So this is where we're seeing these commutes um, for, the, for people that live in Duxbury. So when, I, when the previous slide, it showed that like 20% of the people, well, 30% of the people have uh, maybe fewer than a 20 minute commute, but there's a, a large percent, like 20% or so, that actually have these hour long commutes in these areas. That has really not changed since about 2000. So it's very interesting that you have, some people have very short commutes and others have some very long ones. So also looking at other data, we wanted to do a couple things besides looking at the commutes. So the, the crash data was something that, that piqued our interest. And we said, so what do we want to do? What are we seeing here? So what we did is we mapped the last four years of crash data. And you can see some definite concentrations of activity where there have been crashes. Um, the red is a fatality, the uh, light, Purple is a, is a, is a non-fatal injury. Blue is just a property damage. And there's a couple other areas where maybe there, there, was nothing, there was no data as to what happened, just that there was a crash that's in gray or black. So as you can see here, there's some concentrations you know, in some areas, I think, where you might expect, like the exits uh, off of Route 3 or along 3A and along Hall's Corner. And that's important because we want to see where are these areas happening. So this is maybe an area where we should be looking at maybe trying to do some capacity and safety improvements. We also were interested in, in uh, how many of those I, were perhaps pedestrian and cyclists as well. So we mapped the data of where it was clear that it was a pedestrian or a cyclist. And it has, and for some reason they call this a pedocyclist in the, in the database. I'm not exactly sure why, but that's what you see there. So uh, we have, those are, are in the dots and the triangle. And then the numbers you see, there's 16 down in the exit there, and then 24 and 20 or 40, and then 18. That's data where MassDOT has uh, already indicated that in the last uh, 10 years, 2006 to 2015 data, where they have seen a cluster of crashes for pedestrians and cyclists. And so that's important to, uh, for us to see where, again, where are these concentrations of these, uh, where there's some crashes that require some safety improvements. I know there have been some improvements done in these areas, um, but I think this clearly shows that these are the areas that, that we need to concentrate on. So as I mentioned, at, as you're and as you know, and as I've been talking to people uh, at the boards, uh, there's a limited sidewalk network in town and almost no bicycle facilities. Uh, this has been, this problem or issue, however you want to describe it, has been noted before in the 99 plan and in previous planning efforts, and it was noted as a top challenge in the 2017 survey that was done. So one of the things that we're thinking of that we want to uh, get input on and we're starting to think about is how do we you know, make the safer connections for pedestrians and cyclists and safer connections for uh, automobile users as well. So the yellow here is the, is the, is, uh, the greenway that's been proposed for like the whole um, region, the landline. 
Um, and then your, the arrows kind of show some of those areas where we had seen the crashes before and where there's some sidewalks. And so we're thinking of maybe there's ways to try to fill in the gaps, whether it's a sidewalk or maybe some other options that could be done to improve safety. And how do we improve also the off-road um, connections as well so that those can be a safe way for people to get to and from where they need to go. So um, in, the, in the back there, there'll be some boards uh, that uh, we're gonna asking where in terms of possible treatments that you know, we would like your opinion on. Are there other areas we should be concentrating on for looking at crashes? And um, well, I'm happy to answer any questions um, after the presentation on, on that. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Joe from Public Facilities. Hi, uh, I'm Joe Sackey. I am also a regional planner at MAPC in the Land Use Department. And uh, the part of the plan that I'll be working on is the Public Facilities and Services chapter. Uh, and you see here I have produced a kind of general inventory of both town-owned land and uh, town buildings that are used for services. Um, so there may be some facilities on here that aren't highlighted. Uh, we have a, a copy in the back for you to take a, a closer look. So if there are any important town-owned properties that you think are, are not called out here and do deserve more attention in the plan, uh, one conversation I had earlier was about the public docks. Um, so certainly bring that to my attention because that, as users uh, of these facilities, uh, it certainly helps to get your perspective. Um, first, we're gonna be talking about more general town administration, so rather than the, the buildings and structures that the, uh, the town government, government operates in, uh, looking more at the structure of the, the town government itself. Uh, and both in terms of town administration and town facilities planning, uh, Duxbury seems to have done quite a laudable job, so I don't have uh, that much at this point in terms of corrections. Uh, it's more to call out some of the good work that has been done and is ongoing. So here we get just a general sense, and again, it's a little too small to see on this projection, um, but the way that the, the town governance uh, system is set up, and in terms of um, which department heads report to who, uh, as I'm sure you know, the town is governed by a, uh, an open town meeting form of government with a three-member board of selectmen, uh, and then a town manager form of government was established in 1987. And more recently, so in 2015, um, Duxbury had uh, put together a, um, a government study committee, a nine-member government study committee, uh, and reading through their documents and their published report, uh, they seem to have had uh, quite a robust public process. I'm not sure if any of you were able to participate or were familiar with it, uh, but in general, the, uh, the committee's final report came out uh, and affirmed the basic form of town government. Uh, it doesn't recommend any changes to the open town meeting format uh, with the, the three selectmen and the, the strong town manager, but they did produce a number of recommendations, uh, such as creating an, an audit committee, uh, disbanding the personnel board, and changing the town planner's reporting line. Uh, from the planning board to the town manager, uh, as well as some corrective revisions to the town's general bylaws. Uh, and those recommendations were turned into articles at the 2018 town meeting, uh, and I believe that all of them passed. Um, and so again, I think that's a, a credit to the process where they were able to develop enough buy-in, um, at least at a town meeting, to get support for these recommendations. Um, and so... Moving from there, this is a, a look at the town government itself, so rather than the governance structure in terms of where the, uh, the town staff resources are concentrated. So you'll see that the uh, Duxbury Public Schools has the largest uh, employee, um, has, has the greatest number of what's called uh, FTEs or full-time equivalents uh, with a total of 409, which kind of eclipses uh, most or all of the other uh, uh, general town government departments. Um, the second largest is public safety, uh, which I've collapsed uh, pu police, fire, um, municipal services, and the harbor master into, followed by, by public works, general government, and then the culture and recreation and human services. Um, and in terms of managing the, the facilities within Duxbury, that falls to the, the town of Duxbury's facilities department, uh, which operates on a shared model. So they manage both the, uh, the town government facilities as well as the schools, uh, which is something that I, is more common in uh, municipalities uh, across the region and makes a lot of sense. Um, there is a bit of a, a governance disconnect between the schools and the town government with the, the superintendent and the school board leading the, the, the school 
side and the, uh, the town manager and the board of selectmen leading the general government. Uh, so creating the shared facilities department uh, allows a bit of a, an economy of scale and, and some more holistic uh, planning across, across the town's uh, facilities portfolio. This is, again, a, a, an inventory of the, the, the town facilities. Um, and again, a lot of them are relatively recent construction. The, the central fire station and the police station, uh, which uh, are contiguous, uh, were both constructed in 2012. Um, the senior center, as I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, was built in 2001, but uh, was recently approved for a major uh, expansion coming up, uh, which is projected to be completed in June of 2019. Uh, out of the existing facilities that are, are targeted for improvement, uh, next on the list seems to be the DPW Operations Center. There's currently a feasibility study underway, uh, and design documents and a, a project budget will likely be presented at a next year's town meeting. Um, the middle and high school is obviously another uh, prominent example of uh, facility construction recently, uh, and the other schools have also undergone relatively recent uh, renovations. Here, this just highlights, again, some things I just mentioned in terms of upcoming projects. Uh, I'll be in the, the back corner if you want to talk about specific examples of um, facility improvements that you think are needed uh, or just general feedback about the facilities. And I'm going to turn it over to Sasha. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sasha Scheideroff, and I'm a clean energy and climate planner at MAPC. And I'll be talking about sustainability. And this chapter contains both energy and climate. I'll be talking on the energy side, and then Darcy will be talking about climate planning. Um, we wanted to start off just talking a little bit about sustainability generally and climate change. Um, so as many of you know, as we um, burn greenhouse gases, burn fossil fuels, greenhouse gases are released into the atmosphere. And um, typically the sun obviously shines down to the planet and uh, provides light as well as warmth. And with the greenhouse gases, they create sort of a blanket around the planet, which causes some of those, some of that energy to be trapped within the atmosphere and basically causes war warming over time. Um, so this just shows the, a graph of global temperatures um, increasing over time, as well as the increase in carbon dioxide, which is one of the main greenhouse gases. So we just wanted to start off with this because we're gonna be talking both in terms of climate mitigation, which is uh, energy efficiency, energy reduction, as well as clean energy. And then we're also going to be talking about some of the impacts that our region is starting to face because of climate change and how the region is vulnerable and what we can do about that. So in the energy chapter, we're going to be talking about some of the benefits of energy efficiency and clean energy talking about energy management, uh, what the municipal sector can do, and also what residential and commercial and industrial um, sectors can do across the community. So just as a recap, some of the benefits across energy efficiency and clean energy include saving money and reducing costs. So we see this both with energy efficiency programs as well as uh, clean energy programs. We also see that investing in clean energy can help stabilize energy prices. Um, we often know that fossil fuels like natural gas and oil can be quite volatile and go up and down. Uh, locking into clean energy can help stabilize those. We also see benefits in reducing air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions, and clean energy can add to energy resilience and energy independence. So the town of Duxbury has already done many efforts in this front. Um, so in 2017, last year, the town received Green Communities designation. This is a state-run program that uh, communities across the state uh, apply for and create an energy reduction plan. And so what you do is you create a baseline and then 
figure out a plan to reduce energy use, municipal energy use by 20%. So Duxbury went through this process last year and, have, uh, and has created a five-year plan for energy reduction, which includes things like um, installing energy management systems, LED lighting, smart controls in both the schools and municipal buildings, um, looking at plug loads, ventilation, weatherization, and lastly, looking at how we can change behaviors to reduce municipal energy use. Uh, the town of Duxbury also received a grant from the state to start implementing these projects. As a green community, uh, you are eligible for continuing competitive grants from the state in order to uh, take on these energy efficiency measures. So this is coming out of the designation process last year, looking at municipal energy use. And what we see across the various sectors is that uh, municipal buildings make up about 70% of the energy use from the municipal sector. And uh, vehicles do make up some of it, and then water and sewer make up a small portion. We also see saw that schools are the largest energy users um, in terms of the municipal buildings, and that combined, the middle high school, the elementary, and the two elementary schools make about, up about 42% of the town's energy use. However, um, as Joe mentioned, with the, the recent middle high school construction, that it is actually a very high-performing building, and that it is a verified collaborative high-performance school, um, which is similar to Elite Silver. Um, Moving away from uh, energy efficiency, Duxbury has also done a lot in terms of renewable energy. So there are several roof-mounted arrays um, and solar arrays at the schools and performing arts center. Um, the town has also uh, has a system at the Akushnet gravel pit, um, which provides 25% of the electricity used by municipal buildings. And then there's also a solar array at the town of Duxbury landfill. Um, this is actually a private solar developer that has developed it and then the town purchases through a power purchase agreement some of the energy from that system. And then additionally, while there's no wind turbines in the town, the town does purchase through a power purchase agreement also get electricity from wind outside of Duxbury. Um, similarly, the town has done a lot in terms of solar zoning and allowing for solar, especially on rooftop solar and accessory use for um, small solar. So um, a 50 kilowatt system or less um, that's used for as an accessory use for a primary use is by, allowed by right in several major zones. So if you want to put uh, solar on your roof, uh, you don't have to go through any special permitting processes for that to happen, which really helps lower the barrier for residents and businesses to be able to access the benefits of solar. Um, however, if you want to do ground mounted solar or solar canopies like parking canopies, then it, you would need to go through a site plan review. And then, of course, there is also a specific overlay district for solar, which includes that um, uh, the place where the landfill solar already exists. So flipping and looking at community energy use, so what we were look, the previous graph looked at just municipal sector, so municipal buildings and vehicles. These two graphs look at community use across Duxbury. Um, so we see um, the blue lines are residential and the red is commercial and industrial. And so we see that actually um, annual ele electricity use has stayed pretty steady over the past few years, as has um, the thermal usage, which is natural gas and oil, has stayed fairly steady. However, when comparing energy use to some neighboring communities, um, I compared to both Kingston, which has a slightly smaller population, than Duxbury and Pembroke, which has a slightly larger um, population. We see in the, the top graph on, on electricity use that Duxbury has a fairly high um, electricity use in the residential sector. Um, CNI is fairly low, which I think maps to uh, the fact that there is a smaller commercial and industrial base. Um, and then when we also look at com annual thermal usage, so again, natural gas and oil, we see that the residential sector is also fairly quite high com in compared to comparison to neighbors. 
Um, so just to also recap, I will be back on the boards talking about both clean energy and energy efficiency. So if you want to come chat with me about those topics, I'd be happy to. And now I'm going to turn it over to Darcy to talk about some of the climate vulnerabilities and the recent MVP program. So in the spirit of um, the World Series and my being the last presenter, should we do a seventh inning stretch? <laughs> oh, good. I got to laugh. Okay. Um, my name is Darcy Schofield. I'm a senior environmental planner at MAPC. I've been working with the town of Duxbury for over a year now on your climate vulnerability assessment and action plan, as well as your natural hazard mitigation plan. Uh, some of you may have grabbed the executive summary of our climate vulnerability assessment. Um, at the table, the report is online on the website, and our natural hazard mitigation plan will be online very soon. Next week? Monday. Monday. Talk to Val. Uh, we will also be presenting the natural hazard mitigation plan to the Board of Selectmen on November 19th. So stay tuned. So my role here tonight is to not to go into any great detail on any one of those plans, but to just bring out some of the highlights that we have learned through those plans so that when we're working with, when I work with all of my teammates on these various sectors of the Vision Duxbury, that we are viewing these components with a, ven, uh, with a lens of climate resilience. That being said, I do want to provide just a snapshot of some of the risks, climate risks that Duxbury will face, some of the vulnerabilities, and what we're looking to um, integrate into the plan. So when I work with communities on climate change, I talk about climate risks generally in three different categories. We look at sea level rise, storm surge, and inundation. We look at changes in temperature, and then we also look at change in precipitation regimes. And these are what I will be talking about tonight. So first here, what we're looking at, um, and I also talk about what we've seen, what scientists have observed, or what the data has showed historically, and what scientists are projecting into the future. So what we know is that according to the EPA, 2017 was the warmest year on record, and the decade from 2006 to 2015 was the warmest decade since temperature has been recorded. And um, what does that translate to in the Northeast is an increase in our growing season by 10 days. And that is the graph that you're looking at on the left. So you can see that from 1990, we've seen a pretty significant increase in our growing season. So the, according to the Northeast Climate Science Center from UMass Amherst, we are seeing that over time, our baseline of an annual average temperature of 50 degrees or in the summertime, 69 degrees, that could increase to a baseline of almost 80 degrees as an annual temperature towards the end of the century. One way we like to look at that is how does that translate into extreme heat events, so days over 90 degrees. So scientists are projecting that um, by 2030, we could experience 8 to 13 days over 90 degrees. By the end of the century, that could be 60 to 90 days. However, the last two summers, we've already had over 20 days um, over 90 degrees. So I'm wondering about how that really translates in our, and those, if we have a conservative estimate here. The good news is it'll be more like Alabama and we'll have to do a little less shoveling. So I think we can be very excited about that. More paddleboard days on Duxbury Bay. Um, so the second component is precipitation that I wanted to talk about. So historically, this is a graph on the, on the left is from, um, from the Blue Hill Obs Observatory uh, just up in Milton. And what that is illustrating that in, in the last 50 years, we've had a 10% increase um, in precipitation. In addition, in the Northeast, we've seen a 71% increase in precipitation and the top 1% events. So we think about a 100-year storm, we're already seeing that the, the amount of precipitation falling during those major events is 71% greater than it used to be in the last 50 years. So when we look at projections for the future, scientists are in, con are in consensus that we are going to see more frequent and more severe storms, but we can't, but they have not yet predicted, because science is not, you know, predictive, so we project and we don't predict, um, what that actually will look like. So this is a model, though, that's trying to attempt how we might see increases in the frequency um, and intensity of precipitation. 
So for example, today's 100-year storm um, will in the 27, in 2070, towards mid-century, mid to late century, will become the 25-year storm. So where we might have eight inches of rain in a 100-year storm event, just as an example, winter storm Riley was like a 100-year storm event, March 2nd and 3rd, um, we would see an addition of, 10, uh, of two, two or three more inches of rain during that type of event. Um, in addition, because we are expecting um, greater warming temperatures, we do also anticipate more frequent droughts. So the, the timing of this precipitation is really important in how it will impact our natural systems, our economic systems, how we function in community, longer summers that, were, that are drier with more severe precipitation happening during the winter months. So lastly, the last climate risk that we want to talk about is sea level rise and storm surge inundation. So the graph on the top is from the Boston Tide Station, and what this is illustrating is that in the last century, we've had 11 inches, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. <coughs> in the last century, we've had nearly 11 inches of sea level rise. And um, in the graph, in the table that's below that graph, what is showing is some of the, what scientists, different models are projecting future sea level rise. What I do want to mention is the Boston Tide Gauge model, number three at the bottom, those numbers have been revised. So the numbers that you're looking at here do not account for glacial melting. They've now been revised, and I apologize I didn't put the updated numbers on them, but they're very similar. But what I like to talk about with communities is that what we've seen in the last century is 11 inches. What we anticipate in the next 12 years is eight more inches of sea level rise. So I think that's a really profound um, piece of information that we can start to see that there's a tipping point and an acceleration in the sea level rise that we are experiencing very soon, today and into the future. So I also get very excited about climate change. I think it's very interesting and unique how we are going to reshape our community in the face of, of change. But I, I also like to point out to our communities you have a lot of strengths to bring to bear to this change and, I, and as well as vulnerability. So I hope to talk about them tonight. So the first is, um, when we're let's, let's categorize this in extreme heat. So those little tiny pink dots on the map on the left are areas of extreme heat that exist in Duxbury today. So that are those areas are the top five in the top five percent hottest in the entire metropolitan Boston area. Good news, they're tiny, really not going to have an impact on your life. So if you compare this to another community, Chelsea, for example, their entire city is that bright color pink. So you're in good you're in good shape there. In addition, you have uh, over fifty percent of your community is covered in trees. We can quantify those benefits and cost savings to your community, both from a health and financial perspective. For example, your tree cover avoids 800, nearly 800 million gallons of stormwater runoff, saving the town $770,000 a year. Um, it is mitigating um, over 500,000 pounds per year of air pollutants associated with vehicle emissions. And what this graph, and I do apologize, it's a little bit small to see, but what this graph is showing in the blue are Duxbury hospitalizations for cardiovascular and respiratory diseases. The green are the state average, so you're already in a great place health-wise, and when we think about extreme heat, this is where the health vulnerabilities come, so you're in good shape there. Um, in addition, your trees are sequestering $845,000 a year worth of carbon, or 21,000 pounds. So in comparison, again, to a city like Chelsea, you're looking at 78 pounds. So this, these are really good numbers to, to have in your mind. One of the concerns that I do have for the town of Duxbury with their changing temperatures is the increasing temperatures in your bay. So commercial fishing is a major industry in this town and certainly a cultural identity. And uh, within warming temperatures, which we will see being more um, intense in the Northeast region, uh, we can anticipate that that will create shifts in the natural ecosystems in the bays, potentially affecting the industry or the health of living shorelines that provide shoreline protection for the town. Uh, some of the um, other strengths I want to point out is the town of Duxbury has over 1,200 acres of salt marsh. 
for the most part, these salt marshes are doing extraordinarily well. They're not really showing tremendous sign of erosion um, or deterioration or migration of species. So these shoreline, these salt marshes afford a tremendous amount of shoreline protection to your infrastructure or homes, um, and so you have you have a good a good asset in place at this moment. What the, the, what the uh, map on the left shows, for the light blue, the blue areas are your marshes. The light blue areas are those areas where the marshes are going to need to grow with sea level rise and storm surge. So sea level, uh, salt marshes require inundation of the, of the tide on a regular basis in order to, for their ecological integrity. However, they cannot remain submerged. So we do need to think about into the future ways that we can allow those marshes to migrate both horizontally and vertically to match the pace of sea level rise. One other condition that I wanted to point out, not necessarily associated with sea level rise, but um, certainly related to your seas, is the loss of eelgrass. So we're looking at this map here, the loss of eelgrass from 2012 to 2016. Um, and the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is actually, they call this the DKP, which is the Duxbury, Kingston, Plymouth area. Uh, they actually do it with this like DKP thing. Um, and so they've been studying this. This is actually quite alarming. Uh, the 2016 report that they just completed, that they have shared with me, they are, have an updated report they have not yet shared with me, um, indicates that there's been a 71% loss of eelgrass meadows from 1950 to today. So eelgrass meadows are these meadows of grass submerged ecosystems that are critically important for fish habitat. They are also critically important for dissipating wave energy from hydrodynamics, from wind, boating, or storm surge and, and from coastal storms. They also remove nutrients from the water, so improve water quality, improve water clarity. So it's a really actually very silent ecosystem that's critically important to your community. So the decline of the eelgrass is an important consideration of your vulnerability. The, their initial um, assessment is looking that water quality issues are probably the pr more primary, primary cause from stormwater and wastewater. So runoff associated with extreme precipitation events, wastewater coming in from flooded wastewater systems during coastal storms, for example. So um, good news for the town of Duxbury is that you have no major critical facilities or municipal facilities that are located in a flood zone today or into the future, except the Powder Point Bridge, which is a bridge and we would expect to be in a flood zone. Uh, so certainly that's one we need to be considerate of. Um, one of the other major concerns I have for the town of Duxbury with sea level rise, however, is the potential for saltwater intrusion. As, as I understand that saltwater intrusion is already starting to happen into the aquifer for some of the irrigation wells in the town. So when we think about sea level rise, the water, because the town of Duxbury has uh, very permeable <coughs> soils, so fine, uh, so sandy soils, if you will, so water runs through them very quickly. So when you think about sea level rise, the water doesn't just come over the land, it comes through the land. And when the barrier between the freshwater aquifer and the salt water is, in, is, in a, is a, um, a pervious soil, such as sand, um, then the potential for that salt water to intrude into the aquifer is significant. So we have identified that this is a potential risk there's further study that's needed to understand the magnitude of that risk, which could be nominal, so we have made recommendations to study that further. Um, one other, so very quickly, with increased precipitation events, what I did want to mention is that the town of Duxbury has really tremendous ecological assets associated with your wetlands. So this is called Biomap 2 Core Habitat. These are areas that have been considered exemplary ecosystems by the state. There are also systems that are going to be resilient to our changing climate. So that's how they get categorized into the biomap category. So we have over 12, nearly 13,000 acres of aquatic core um, that are extreme uh, e exemplary ecosystems, um, nearly 200 acres of wetlands that are exemplary ecos ecosystems. 
So when um, what this map here is illustrating, though, is the 1% annual chance storm, or better known as the 100-year storm. Um, but I like to say 1% annual chance instead because we have a greater, you know, 1% chance that that could happen in any given year. Um, and flood, the green areas are the open space, and the blue areas are your areas of a zone well, a zone one, um, where you would have well heads for drinking water. So what I wanted to highlight is though, you do not have any wellheads located in a future flood zone, but there is some potential for contamination associated with inland flooding from extreme precipitation events. So that's what we wanted to point out here. Um, and what is, in, in addition, again, those trees are doing a great job and the water quality in the bays are, in the rivers is generally doing really well. But we do want to point out that risk. So as I mentioned, the DEP and the, uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has ascertained that they believe initial eelgrass loss has been created by water quality issues. Right now, we do have some um, impairments in Duxbury Bay, Kingston Bay, and the Bluefish River, and Jones River, of course, which flows. So we are looking at fecal coliform from systems. So it is one of those things where we're having increased precipitation events and acceleration of those water ish quality issues as a vulnerability. So, but yet the sun will rise on Duxbury Beach and we will have a good day. So what I did want to reinforce is we've done a, a number of different um, recommendations to ensure that Duxbury remains a vibrant community in the face of climate change, both for future projections and for natural hazard mitigation, which is looking at some of those um, extreme weather events that we're having today and how we can help to mitigate. Those two plans also, I would like to add, qualifies the town of Duxbury for state and federal funding for doing mitigation measures such as further studies of the, um, of the aquifer or repairing the seawall that was broached this, this winter. Um, so we'll take a, I will take a look at, as I mentioned, all of my colleagues' works and their recommendations, and we will filter these, these actions that have already been put together and these vulnerabilities so that we, through the recommendations with the lens of climate resilience to ensure uh, Envision Duxbury remains a vibrant community. So I will be in the back, and I'll be happy to take any of your questions, and you can always welcome to follow up with me as well. Thank you. Yes. Thank you our, to our fantastic team. That was a lot of information, and thank you for all uh, being patient with us to get that amount of information out. Uh, we do have a few seconds if you'd like to pose a question to us in this setting. Otherwise, what we'd actually prefer is to talk with you individually in the open house setting and to get your feedback on the boards. But if you have a question now, Please do step up the microphone. That's the only condition for the cable TV folks. All right, then let me just tell you a few things about the open house setting. Hopefully you have one of these handouts, which are also available on the table by the door. On the back, write as many thoughts that came to mind as you listen to those presentations about what your priorities are for these topic areas. And then also talk with us around at the boards. We have a lot of different exercises, dot voting, uh, suggestions for what your uh, perspectives are on all of these topics and issues. We're trying to uh, gather as much analysis and information for then you all to help us <coughs> decide what the priorities and actions should be for the town. Uh, so that your information and feedback this evening is what's most important to us about this process right now. Uh, and fe please feel free to catch up with the process now and in the future at that website, envisionduxbury.mapc.org. Check back there, we'll continue to update it. And there's contact information for our whole team on that website as well. So if you're sitting a week from now and think, man, I should have talked to them about this, shoot us an email, get in touch with us. We'd love to talk to you. From here, we'll be compiling your information that you give us this evening and then going directly into thinking about the strategies and goals that should be associated with these topics that we presented to you this evening. We'll be back in front of the planning board to talk about those goals and strategies in November. Uh, and then again in February to think about how all of these topics are starting to come together. So it's a lot of uh, both diving into the details of each of these, but then we want to come back up and see how they relate to each other, what the synergies are, how does 
transportation relate to economic development, relate to land use, and how does all that fit within climate resiliency and sustainability? So we'll be thinking about that as a team and bringing everything together and then looking at a community forum at some point in March, which will get out the word when that's going to occur uh, and engage you all again. So thank you for coming. Uh, if you're inclined to go catch the first pitch, I think you might just make it, uh, but we'd love to hear your feedback and have you hang out with us for a few more minutes. Thank you very much.